we're very happy to to have the zero cost for deep learning uh, zero cost deep learning for microscopist um, team here with us um, so we are Nelbias, Nelbias Academy. Um, we started last year with um, giving these webinars uh, about the image analysis. And so far we've had more than 15,000 registrations and 53,000 views on YouTube, which is great. We're very excited to continue this. Um, and today we have zero cost deep learning for microscopy team. We have Guillaume Jacquemet from Obokademi University um, in Finland and Romain Leine from uh, MRC, uh, who is a MRC research fellow uh, from UCL London. Um, and as a moderator, we have Lucas von Chamier with us also from London. And me and Mafalda and Rocco from Neobias team will be moderating this webinar. So, um, Roman, I give the floor to you. Great. So, thank you very much for the introduction, Elmas. And um, I want to thank all of the organizers and everyone in the New Bias team for organizing that fantastic uh, initiative. I think that's that's just been great to keep up with everyone through those uh, through those means and I'd like to thank you for inviting us over as well and to give us the chance to speak a little bit about zero cost um, so let's get started so can you guys see my slides all good if I don't hear yes, anything I'll assume it's all good excellent thank you so zero cost deep learning for me essentially is a platform that intends to uh, make available deep learning for microscopy and to make it available in a hassle-free way, right? Without requiring any uh, programming skills and or even computational power. And I'll introduce this to you very shortly. Um, but I'd like to start by showing you a couple of, um, a couple of uh, context to this, a little bit of context to this. And um, as a lot of you might have seen, in the recent years, there's been a huge boom in uh, the number of papers and publications, both from the bioimaging com uh, community as well as the computer science community in uh, developing and using deep learning for image analysis, ranging from image segmentation, denoising, and uh, uh, quite a wide range of tasks and showing really quite promising uh, levels of performance. Um, but I would like to give you just a very brief introduction to uh, what I think was a deep learning revolution in the recent years and where that, um, that kind of revolution kind of came about. Because in fact, deep learning and the idea of neural network is, um, is actually very old. It's not a, it's not a recent idea. It's, it comes back from, from the 50s, back in the days where computers would take a whole room full of electronic e equipment. But at that time, it remained only a a sort of mathematical oddity because no one could really optimize those neural networks. And that's only uh, back in the 80s and in the early 2000s with invention of backpropagation algorithm and the development and the availability of GPU technologies that make actually, that made actually neural network and deep learning uh, practical and practically feasible. And um, from then on actually, that's in 2012 through the um, presentation of the so-called AlexNet network uh, um, that really showed in the context of image classification, right? Given a specific image, um, let's get an algorithm that actually identifies what's in this image. And you, you can imagine many applications for this, of course. Um, and so this AlexNet um, work back in 2012 was the first one to show convolutional neural network massively outperforming many other, uh, many other approaches. And that's when the attention was really driven to deep learning in terms of image and computer vision. Um, and so then in 2015, uh, a new architecture came about um, called UNET that actually made 
beyond, beyond the idea of just image classification that made deep learning very suitable for image analysis, going from an image to another image. And in particular here, the authors demonstrated that it's really powerful for image segmentation as demonstrated on electron microscopy data, as you can see here. And the rest is effectively history, right? In the recent years and since 2018, there's been a, an absolute enormous development in, of, of neural networks and availability and platforms and so on. And what I'm showing you here is only just a very small subset of what's um, actually been created by a fantastic community. Um, but what really is the fuss about deep learning? And um, for this, it's important to remember that for classical algorithms, um, the effort is actually put onto the design of mathematical functions that will perform a specific task. So here in this case, on the left, I show you a noisy image that needs to be denoised. And that's the kind of, on the right, that's the kind of target we're trying to aim at. So we're going to design a couple of mathematical functions that will go from noisy to denoised image. So that could be, you can think, of um, uh, Gaussian, Gaussian filters, median filters, um, you know, there's a range of very easy classical algorithms that I'm sure most of you will have used for, for this. But the effort is put into designing those and then the input, um, the input is fed into this algorithm and the output is deterministic. In the case of deep learning, the approach is really quite turned upside down because in this case, we actually start from the data itself. So we prepare typically a bunch of paired data, bunch of input data and the equivalent output data where actually um, the input represents what we intend to feed into the network and the output being what we intend to recover from the network. And in, at, that, at that stage, what we do is we actually feed those input and output into a, a, a neural network that will therefore learn and tune its own parameters in order to be able to provide eventually a function that will actually be able to uh, transform the inputs into the outputs as faithfully as possible. And so that's the training stage and you see that really is the essential step for deep learning for um, obtaining a model that is performant. And then once this training is, is finalized, we can now obtain a trained model where the parameters are actually fixed and then feeding a new image now leads to an output that is um, performing the tasks that we intended for, for that neural network. In this particular case, we actually can obtain the equivalent denoised image from the, um, from the input image. And so um, you see that what's really important in the case of deep learning is the training step. And in fact, it is all about the training or the performance and even the task that is performed by the neural network it really depends on the training. And what's really important to know about a training is that training leads to a form of embedding of structural priors within, um, within the function that is built within the neural network, within the model. And so um, I like to actually um, demonstrate or, or showcase this from a very elegant example from uh, W. Murner's paper from last year, uh, where they actually built um, a couple of uh, neural network models that, that are capable of, of uh, recovering from sparse sampling images, right? Such as here of very, very simple structures, square, round, rectangles, and triangles. And they build neural networks that try to recover the initial underlying ground truth structure from those sparsely sampled images. And so what they elegantly showed is that if you take a neural network, but you only train it on rectangles, it will only have ever seen rectangles. So it will see and think that they are rectangles all over the shop, right? So it finds rectangles even when um, the underlying structure truly is a, 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 a square or a, um, or a circle or a triangle. And that's obviously suboptimal. And similarly, if you train it only on triangle, it will find triangles. So what this means is that the training data set needs to contain all of the representative or the important shapes that will be observed um, in the data subsequently. So in this case, if you train a neural network on all four shapes, then disregarding of what was uh, fed into 
um, the sparse sampled image, sparsely sampled image, it recovers the appropriate images or the appropriate substructures. So the, the take home message from this slide is that it really is essential to train neural networks on your own data. So training is essential. Um, and so if we go back to, to this slide for a second, um, what's great about neural network is that um, it can approximate pretty much any transforms provided it can learn it. And so I've shown you here uh, an example of denoising task starting from a noisy image and ending up from a denoised equivalent. But in fact, you could feed any equivalent image. And if you find enough, um, enough, um, enough data within your, the training data to, to, to learn that transform, it will learn it. And it can also massively outperform classical algorithms for a wide range of tasks. And that's also really quite important for, uh, for bioimage analysis. And so those are good things about deep learning, right? It's performance and it can also be fast. But uh, what's less good about it is that um, deep learning actually needs um, quite a, a high level of expert computational skills and still today requires um, a lot of um, maybe programming skills and um, quite adventure in, needs us to be quite adventurous in how to set up uh, deep learning architectures. Um, and also quite importantly is the training step really requires high computational powers and in particular um, the access to GPUs for those, uh, for those training sessions to actually complete within reasonable times. And so those are actually um, hurdles towards the use of deep learning for the, bio, for the bioimage community and the, the biomedical research uh, uh, community as well. So that's actually um, what, what we've seen as um, really a difficulty towards using deep learning. And so I'd like to show this image which is the, uh, a picture of Michael Hopkins, uh, uh, an ISS uh, astronaut uh, who's, who's performing some basic maintenance on the ISS. And so that's a range of comput computer, hardware and software um, handling that is actually quite not trivial at all. And so I, I kind of like to uh, compare that to training a neural network in some cases, where it, which really requires um, a difficult combination of handling of hardware and software. So, um, hence, um, we wanted to build a platform that would make all of those things a lot easier. And so, that, hence, our platform Zero Cost DL4 Make. So, it all starts from your computer, and your computer does not need to have any specific computational power. Um, all you need to have is the data that you will um, wish to use as training data as well as the new data that you then therefore need to, um, to process through your newly trained model. And so the, um, the platform actually outsources all the heavy duty computational um, expense to the cloud by using a range of uh, resources made available by, by Google, and in particular Google Drive and Google Colab. And so by uploading all of this data, all of this um, all of the computational power is only required on the cloud and therefore is not um, on your own machine. What we provide therefore within this platform is a range of notebooks which are basically um, essentially um, a, um, a range of um, methods that, that contain user interfaces and that contains all the individual parameters uh, that the user needs to think about and set in order to uh, set a training session going. And so this enables the communication between Google Drive and Google Colab, um, and therefore the use of GPUs that are made available in Google Colab. And so all of those, um, that interaction between the now on the cloud data and the notebook and Colab makes the network training um, occur all the way on the cloud. But we've also incorporated the important step of validation, and I'll get back to this a little bit later on, um, which allows the users to validate and explore the performance of a particular model on um, validation data set and also to run predictions. So that means from the trained and validated model to be able to use that specific model directly on the cloud to process the new data and to obtain, say, as I shown you before, the denoise data from the noisy images. And the final step is, of course, to recover down to the user's machine the train model for further use and the results from um, the predictions obtained in step number four.
And so you see again that all of this is performed in the cloud and therefore um, uh, zero cost, the, the platform essentially provides a range of advantages, one of which is it's actually completely free and the access to uh, GPUs are made available for free via, via Google Colab. Um, and we're taking advantage of this. Um, it's, we've also built a simple user interface that requires therefore no coding and that's therefore very accessible to the wider uh, biomedical research community. And um, quite importantly, it's a single platform that performs both well, training, prediction, and quality control through that validation step. And that also builds trust with respect to uh, the use of um, models uh, built by uh, deep learning in this case. Um, and so all of this is performed in the cloud and takes the shape essentially of just um, a web page. And so it only requires web browsers. And so that, that's, that makes it also very versatile. And we'll take a look at that when we get around to taking a look at the demo. So um, what can the platform actually do? The platform, um, and so what I should say here is we've built a platform around the idea of um, incorporating a lot of pre-existing networks that are built by um, state-of-the-art computer scientists and uh, bioimage analysts, and we've only incorporated in those networks. We've not built actually our own networks. And so we've uh, closely interacted with all the developers to be able to do this. Um, and so what can it actually do? Uh, performs image segmentation and object detection. So we've incorporated uh, UNET in order to do um, image segmentation, as you can see here, both in 2D and in 3D, as shown here in the uh, segmentation of mitochondrial network from electron microscopy data. But also we've incorporated Stardist as a nuclear segmentation a network on fluorescence and bright field images. Um, as well as uh, fast object detection using YOLO V2, but that also that is also capable of uh, classifying each individual object that is detected within an image. And so you see that can be really powerful if you're looking at, um, say, white field or bright field uh, cell migration assay, live cell migration assay right here. Um, another type of task that we've incorporated is that of image denoising. And uh, what we've built is um, a, a care network based on the work from Weigert et al. And so that is really quite a network that is very powerful in, in denoising and even removing a number of artifacts such as those obtained in SIM microscopy, as you can see here. But we've also implemented um, uh, self-supervised uh, denoising methods such as nose to void 2D and 3D. And here you see a live cell mitochondrial uh, data network or dynamics um, denoised in 3D. Um, and another type of task that we've also implemented is um, uh, something that is very quite exciting to me is image to image translation. And the idea is, is um, to actually feed uh, the network with, um, for instance, bright field images as input and fluorescence images as output. And so what this means is that now the neural network learns to predict uh, a pseudo fluorescence output purely based on the bright field images. And that's something that would be extremely difficult with classical algorithms. And so we've implemented the Uncomol et al um, approach right here, but as well, we've, we've uh, implemented methods based on, on GAN, on GAN architectures, such as here, Pix2Pix um, networks. And so Pix2Pix here in this case allowed us to predict um, fake nuclear signal, say DAPI signal, purely from an actin label um, signal. And Guillaume will show you a little bit more data on this later on. Um, so, but the, but the bottom line is you can do all of this, but uh, if you cannot trust the model to give you something that is robust and reliable, what is the point? So can you trust your model? And so we've incorporated the validation step as I've mentioned to you. Um, and let me just introduce you to a couple of concepts that we've incorporated within the platform. So imagine you've got a source image and you want to denoise it and you obtain this prediction. Can you actually believe that this prediction is, is robustly representing the underlying data and the underlying structure? So the trick here is to actually do a little bit of comparison to data for which you have uh, acquired some actual ground truth target data. And so the, the, the concept is pretty simple is let's compare those two. 
do they match? If so, then yes, we can trust the model. And one uh, very intuitive way of doing this is to actually compare simply the, the difference, take the difference of those two images and compute something called the root mean square error. And so a low error is a good thing in this case. And here we can actually plot this as a map. And so a low map um, or a map showing low values is a good thing in case of um, plotting the errors. But we can also incorporating um, other structural similarity methods such as the SSI metric right here for which a high structural similarity close to one is a good thing and in here in this particular case we obtain a high structural similarity also highlighting that this particular prediction is of good quality and can be trusted and so we can extend this to, uh, to the whole network for that kind of data set essentially. But beyond this, actually, those kind of metrics and analysis really allow us to go a little bit beyond just uh, building trust into the model because we can also then start comparing different kind of predictions using, using those metrics. So here we've got noisy input and we've got the ground truth to which we can compare it. And so we've compared for this particular data set three kind of denoising methods um, and we have the metrics that can compare them. In this particular case for this particular data set, the care prediction performed best. But what we can also see um, beyond the, the metrics themselves is the structural similarity maps also gives us an insight into how the individual um, uh, networks perform with respect to artifacts in, in, in what places the artifacts tend to occur. So that gives really a, a good understanding in terms of how the model actually performs. In the case of segmentation, we use a very classical uh, metric, which is called the intersection over union, the IOU metric. And so all that this uh, performs essentially, all that this computes is um, the sum of all the pixels that are uh, overlapping between the target and the prediction um, masks essentially, uh, divided by the sum of all the pixels that, are, that belong to either of the two uh, images. And so here, if we have segmented, so if we have the masks, the target get mask from this image and the predicted mask from this image, we can now compute the overlay between the target and the prediction. The white pixels here represent uh, the overlapping pixels, so the good ones. So the, the intersection represent all of the white pixels, whereas the union represent all the white pixels, including the false positive and the false negatives that are shown here in green and magenta in this image. And so you see that the union will always be greater or equal to uh, the intersection. So a IOU close to one is a good thing in this case. And so here in this particular case, we obtain a very high IOU and that's a great thing for this um, particular data set. And similarly to before, we can use this IOU to do a number of things. And in particular here, what I'm showing you is um, in how the IOU metric can be used to check the uh, evolution of the uh, network performance over the number of epochs. So over the time over which it, um, it trains and learns to, uh, to perform the task of segmentation. And so you see here, um, as the number of epochs increases, the IOU increases itself. But as well, if we look at representative images, the number of epochs uh, leads to a better masks that's highlighted by um, a, a higher number of white pixels in those images. And similar to before, we can also use the IOU to compare a range of different uh, segmentation approaches. And here in this particular case, again, for this particular data set, we found that uh, looking at the metrics, the IOU metric here, that the nuclei is a general nuclei uh, model actually performed best in this particular case. But you can uh, think of using that kind of approach um, on a range of different uh, data set and on a range of different networks. Um, so the deep the zero cost doesn't live um, on its own. It belongs um, to a wide range, uh, to a wider community, to the deep learning bioimage ecosystem and talks to a range of different uh, other communities and in particular interfaces quite heavily with the CSB deep team um, for which we actually zero cost can provide a training engine, for instance, for, mod for networks like care, noise to void, and deco noising. Similarly, for Stardust 2D and 3D, zero cost can, can provide uh, an efficient training engine for those networks. Um, and those two guys then therefore start talking to uh, Fiji quite, um, 
quite efficiently through their respective plugins. Um, but Zero Cost also interfaces uh, with the DeepImageJ community as well, for which we also um, provide a training engine for a number of, of networks, UNet 2D and 3D, as well as DeepStorm. And DeepImageJ, of course, is implemented within uh, Fiji in this case. Um, and um, we also can integrate Zero Cost DLFormic within larger image analysis pipelines, such as interfacing with TrackMate. And here again, um, Guillaume will show you a little bit more data on, on how this can be done. Um, but we also interface more and more, um, more and more recently with the bioimage.io uh, community as well, which is a, re a repository for pre-trained model notebooks, but also data set um, from which, um, uh, from which uh, those different pipelines can be made available. And of course, all of those different uh, teams talk to each other uh, very efficiently. And so you see that this interface actually makes uh, that whole community um, grow more powerful and grow uh, more efficient. And so just to wrap, uh, wrap this up, uh, what I've talked to you about today is, is um, our platform, which is essentially a platform that's great when you are forced to work from home. Um, and we've, um, we've also put quite a lot of effort into document, documenting this as best as we can. And so we've got our GitHub page that you can see here, and we'll take a quick look at that. Um, during the demo and we've also implemented a range of different um, image analysis tasks that makes it very versatile and, and that's a good place to compare a range of networks as well. Um, and so just to, uh, to finish here, I'd like to thank all of the uh, people that have contributed to this absolutely enormous efforts and so the teams and the people that have contributed to this um, uh, is, um, is actually unprecedented at least in, in, my, um, <laughs> in my experience, we've talked to beta testers, developers, um, uh, people from the bioimaging, the deep learning community, and so on. That's, that's been an absolutely huge effort. I'd like to thank everyone. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot, Koma. Uh, so I don't think we have um, any specific questions to ask you uh, right away. So uh, what we're going to do now, while people start to ask questions in the Q&A, um, then I will slowly uh, give a, a quick demo of what our uh, wiki looks like uh, um, while Roma takes his breath. And then after that, mm -hmm. uh, Roma will, will take you through a full demo of, of one of our um, notebooks. Thank you, Guillaume. So I'm, I'm going to share my screen now. So um, hello everyone, by the way. So, so my name is, is uh, Guillaume Jacquemet. So I'm a group leader at Robo Academy and, and I'm um, one of the labs that's been involved in, in developing this um, zero cost uh, platform. And, and what I would like to do now is basically just take five minutes to show you what uh, uh, basically our website look like. Because at the moment, uh, most of our platform is, is really based on, on GitHub and uh, uh, maybe um, I feel a little bit intimidating for some of you that just want to get started and, and analyzing your images. So, so if you, uh, um, you know, Google zero cost deep learning for microscopy in, in Google, very likely you, you will find uh, this uh, GitHub page uh, as that's actually hosted by Ricardo Enriquez's groups. Uh, um, and then you will find that zero cost deep learning for microscopy. And as with many GitHub pages, you will first see, uh, um, you know, the code and, and so on, and, and then a quick uh, explanation of what it is all about. Um, importantly, you will also see here uh, quite a lot of uh, video material for to help you get started within the platform. Uh, you will see uh, uh, talks uh, that, that Roma and others have, have given uh, for the past few months, uh, but also video tutorials on how to use the platform. So it's a really good place also for you to, to get started if you want to start using uh, the platform. And then we will, of course, also put the, the Nubia talks when it's available on, on YouTube uh, here as well. Uh, but what I just wanted to show you is that uh, here on, on the GitHub page, then you can uh, click on our wiki, and that's where most of the exciting stuff actually is. Um, and in our wiki, uh, we, uh, as Roman said during his talk, we, we try to put quite a lot of efforts in kind of uh, adding documentation to, to help people get started with the platform as quickly as possible. And, and you will see here on, on the side of the wiki, we have a lot of kind of documentation. We have a step-by-step -step guides, 
uh, uh, we have uh, tip and tricks and then specific section dedicated to some of the things that Roma will, will explain during his presentation on data augmentation and, and so on. Uh, and, and we also have detailed description on, on some of the networks that are available through the platform. Um, but if you scroll down, uh, then here is basically where you will see all the different uh, deep learning networks that are available through our platform. And, and our platform is really a collection of Jupyter notebooks that can be run through Google Colab to do specific tasks. Uh, and that's where basically most of the useful information can be found is what kind of deep learning networks that, that others have, have created, what can they be used for, or what have they been shown to be used for. Uh, um, and then if you want to start uh, using them, then you can uh, uh, basically right click here. So for instance, an example for study study, you can right click here to open it directly in Google Colab and then you will have it that uh, now opens in a different tab. So, so um, I will not show you uh, too much uh, the notebooks because uh, that's uh, what Roma will do now. Um, but one thing that I just wanted to highlight is uh, one of the things that we worked really hard on is to try to make sure that the platform was as similar as possible for the different uh, uh, deep learning uh, notebooks that we provide. So, so for instance, if you open uh, Stardist uh, 2D or, or Noise to Void 2D, so one which we will maybe use to do uh, a segmentation, especially of, of nuclei, and one that would be for denoising. So the overall structures of the notebook is exactly the same. Uh, you will have, of course, information and code that is dedicated to those different uh, um, uh, notebooks. Um, but, but hopefully, if you, once you've learned how to use one of those notebooks, you should be very quickly able to, to move to a different uh, uh, deep learning task, uh, which hopefully will, will um, be really useful when you start to want to, to use deep learning for uh, a wide range of bioimage analysis. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is a very brief introduction. So, so um, once you kind of reach our GitHub, then don't be uh, alarmed by by the the main GitHub page. Uh, uh, travel to the to the wiki page, uh, where you will find a lot of information and videos on how to get started and uh, um, some uh, links to access the various notebooks. So, on that, that was my brief introduction of of our GitHub, and then uh, I will leave now Roma. Uh, to, to go through one of our notebooks so that you get an idea on actually uh, what you need to do if you want to, to use them. Cool. Thank you, Guillaume. Um, so I will now share my screen again. Um, <clears throat> what we'll be doing today as a very quick demo uh, will be to do a little bit of image segmentation of nuclei using Stardust 2D. And so as Guillaume just showed you, here's the wiki page from our GitHub. Um, and then starting a notebook in a collab session is as easy as opening that um, collab um, that collab widget right here, and so what which will open um, <clears throat> there you go a web page in collab um, on Stardust there you go, and so yours might look um, might look slightly different. I've used the sleek. A dark background version of this because it, because I find it easier to to see. Um, but let's and now we've got the notebook open. Let's take a quick look at another essential item that we need for training, which is the data set. Um, so in the uh, chat, you can see that we've shared um, a link as well to a Zenodo page from which you can download representative data. Um, which is the data that we've used um, and demonstrated our Stardust notebook in our paper, but it's completely made available for you to uh, get started on uh, playing with this notebook. And so all that data is, is essentially a set of, um, of data, a set of paired data, I should say, right, from which we have equivalent um, initial images. So here they're fluorescence, fluorescence images, of, uh, of nuclei uh, that you can see right here and the equivalent segmented images um, that are uh, that correspond to that particular image. And so we've got these pairs for a range of data, which you can see right here. And so by downloading this, you now have a little bit of training data set. Um, what I'm trying to highlight to you right here is um, that this um, burden of building the training data set typically is on the user and the emphasis should really be put on uh, how to build and curate the training data set 
for any deep learning model to work uh, properly or as intended. Okay, so I've already uploaded that data set to my Google Drive, uh, so we can simply go ahead with um, taking a look at the Stardust notebook. So what you see on the left right here is actually the table of contents of the notebook. And as Guillaume said, all of our notebooks are roughly around the same template and you'll find first a range of installation to install all the dependencies for that particular task, then a range of parameter settings. So that will mainly consist in uh, telling the network where to find the uh, training data. And then there will be a step of actual running the training data set, uh, running, the tr running the training on the data set, sorry. And then there's um, step number five and six, which are respectively the, uh, the model validation, evaluation of your, evaluate your model right here. And then in step six, once the validation has been performed, uh, we can then use the, pre the, the, this, um, the model that we've just trained on, um, on a range of data. So let's get started with this. And so the initial steps, um, so I should just say before I, I get started that all of this is we've tried to, um, to document this as much as possible within the notebooks themselves. So uh, following along simply the explanation should get you to some relevant places already. Um, and so we can already start um, getting GPU access and also start mounting the data. So that means we can access uh, the data that's on a specific uh, Google Drive account. And this is what I'm doing right here for you. Um, all you need to do is to get an access code that you can paste in and you've th therefore given access to that particular session to your, um, to your Google Drive. Uh, so it's now mounted. We can now start installing these. Um, and so while the installation is performed, let me show you on the left how the Google Drive is now accessible within that session. And what you'll find right here is all sorts of data that's available. That's essentially a copy of my, um, of my entire Google Drive. Um, and so I'll just be going into the folders where I've copied that start this 2D data. And so I've got a range of data and you will recognize some of the folders that I've just mentioned to you. Um, and so if I now open this, you see that the data I've just shown you in Fiji is also there now, right? Um, so let's finish the installation. Um, there's a second step to this that allows everything to be, um, to be set properly. And that loads uh, all the key dependencies and then we're good to go. So now again, let's get to the uh, stage of setting the, um, the parameters. And so if we open the folder that's relevant for me, um, I've got training images, the images and the masks are in those two different folders. I can now input them into, um, into uh, the, the user interface right here. Let's give the name, uh, let's give the model a name. I like to put the, the date of today, 15, uh, star dist model one, um, and then model path, I will tell it to save, um, to save the, um, the model into a folder that I've created already previously, which is called models. Um, and then we'll run a few, fewer number of epochs than, than initially, than, than set by default, we'll run it just for 10 epochs in the interest of time in this case, right? And so all the other inputs are essentially um, uh, more subtle parameters for, um, for setting the, the networks and we're not going to talk about this today in the interest of time um, because the default parameters already um, work pretty well. So we've now loaded uh, the, the data set, source and targets are available right here. We've got access to data augmentation. We'll, um, I'll initially not do any data augmentation, um, but in, on the other hand, we'll also load a pre-trained network, right? Which is available from the, um, from the Stardust, um, from the Stardust repository directly. Um, made available by the original authors of that network. So we'll use this as a pre-trained model. That's a way to essentially widely speed up 
uh, the um, the training speeds because it instead of starting completely from scratch, it starts from a model that's already been trained on a range of data. And so I'll set this up so that it'll use this um, this uh, pre-trained network, um, and we can now start initiating initializing a range of variables for this, creating the model and the data set objects, um, which might take um, just a minute or two. Um, and then following this, we'll be able to start the training right here. So um, are there any questions while this is happening, Guillaume and Lucas? Yeah, both me and Lucas are answering to, to, to various questions, but I don't think there's any direct question on, on the training yet. Okay, excellent, excellent. So this might take um, a little bit of time just to load um, the individual data sets. So what we have right here is quite a, a, a large number of, of images, as you see right here that we've manually created, or I should say Guillaume has manually created for this, um, and that has, um, that has made this uh, quite a powerful training data set for what we're going to try to do today. How are we doing with time, by the way? We are also fine with time, Roma. So we have another good 15 minutes for the demo. For this demo? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. There you go. So the time that it took right here is essentially to um, to sift through the data and load an, a range of um, range, load the relevant data set to RAM, and that takes a little bit of time uh, due to data transfer. And that's what it's doing right now. Now everything, all the different um, variables are set, and therefore the training um, the training started. And what we can see right here is. There you go, training is happening. Epoch one out of 10 is, uh, is gonna go through a bunch of steps for each epoch. Here in this particular case, 23 steps per epoch. It's just finished the first epoch and moving along to the second one. Um, so while this is happening, it's just going to take one minute. I'll just move straight back up to show you something that I've only, um, um, I've only brushed on very quickly. And so that initial, um, uh, that initial installation that happened all the way at the top of the of the notebook actually told us which kind of GPU was made available to us through this particular uh, collab uh, collab session. So what we see here is that we've got a Tesla T4 um, GPU made available through that particular session. So you'll you'll find if you try this at home. Uh, that you may uh, obtain different kind of GPUs, which uh, will therefore impact on how fast your training and your individual steps um, will go for. And you can have an idea of how much RAM is available on this particular card and so on and so forth. Um, so that also gives us a little bit of information about um, the virtual machine that Google Collab has, has made available for us uh, for this session. So let's go back to... Um, to our training so we're now nearly done um, and so this will allow us to um, therefore what we'll do next once this is finished is we'll do a little bit of evaluation of this model um, and for this uh, we'll be inspecting the the loss function and we'll also be doing a little bit of error mapping uh, exactly as I've shown you in my talk and so for this error mapping and for the quality control, we'll be using a set of uh, ground truth images uh, that, uh, that we have available right here. And I can give those path already um, so that we can save just a little bit of time. Um, I'll put that in there. And so if we, uh, now all the different epochs have been um, executed and now it's just completing a little bit of um, a fine tuning of the network. And there you go. And so the network has now um, been trained. And the model, if I go and show you um, into my 
uh, into my uh, very busy model folder. What you see here is right here the folder that now contains all the information about the model that we've trained. And since I've um, I've used a link that is directly onto the, my, my Google Drive, then my, uh, my created model here is already saved onto the Google Drive. So there's a range of information in there, including um, a, a PDF report, which I can show you actually, let's do that. Um, within that folder, there's a PDF report, um, which if I open right here, um, actually will inform you on all the different settings that were used for that particular training session. So that'll include all the parameters that were set, but also a range of information about um, the different versions of the different important uh, libraries that were used, uh, also the location of the different training data set, right? And so that's quite important to keep track of what's, what's happened for each individual models. Um, but now let's evaluate our model. So let's run this. So we told it to just um, evaluate the current model. And so we can take a look at the, um, um, the, loss, the loss function, but because we've only trained it over 10, um, over 10 epochs, there's very few to visualize anything really useful on the, um, on the loss curves. But you see that generally speaking, both the training and the validation losses decrease, which is um, a, an, an indication that the, um, the performance of the model is improving over the number of epochs. Um, and so now let's do a little bit of error mapping on this particular data set. Um, so I've already uh, given it access to some test data set that were not present in the training data set. That's important for a reliability of the validation step. And so what this step will therefore do is do exactly what I've shown you in my talk is to compare um, images to ground truth images uh, that we've provided. And so what you see here is the ground truth um, that was provided, the, the predictions right here. And you see the overlay here is showed in um, dark magenta, um, whereas the light magenta and the green represents the false positive and false negatives. So if we take a look at the intersection of a union, it's 0 0.852, and that's already really quite good for this uh, for such a short for such a short training session. So the trick right here was actually to use a pre-trained model, as I've shown you earlier. So if we wanted to improve a little bit on that performance, one thing that we could do is we could go back up um, and then train a, se a second model. So let's change the name of the model. We run this. I'll just take one second. There you go. But this case will implement data augmentation as well. So data augmentation will essentially flip and rotate your um, the provided training data set to increase the diversity of, um, of, of the content, of the structural content of the data, and will make it more robust. We could also add a little bit of, um, add further um, number of epochs, so to train for longer, essentially, that would also improve the, pro the, the performance of the network. So let's, let's just do data augmentation for this um, in this particular case and also do some pre-trained model. Here's a pre-trained model, as we've shown before. Uh, this will only take a couple of seconds now. Uh, everything is already in RAM. That's great. And we can now start the second training session, um, which will now create a second model that I will be taking a look at. So I think, um, that gives you a very good overview on how to run um, a training session. And so while this new training session is running, I will just very briefly show you how um, the last part of the notebook looks like, which is, um, so beyond quality control, which is how to use the train model. So now that you have your train model, it's sitting somewhere um, onto your Google Drive. You can now use this section to simply load new data that it's never seen to actually perform in this particular case, the segmentation using the currently trained model. And that's as simple as providing the right folder and the folder where the masks should be saved. Um, but we're not going to cover this today in the interest of time because that's, um, that's also fairly straightforward. Um, so Guillaume, I think I'll hand over back to you 
for the um, for the next step in in those presentation. Uh, thanks, Thomas. So, so maybe uh, to disrupt things a little bit, maybe you could yeah. show the very last uh, cell uh, in Stardust, uh, which is um, if you're okay. interested in, in making prediction in uh, very very large images, then then we also incorporate that. Uh, yes. Um, in this in the studies uh, notebook, so there now we're talking about uh, gigapixel size data. Uh, then, if you now train a data set using small uh, images, then you can still start to apply them to very large data set. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you want me to run a little bit of data on this? No, no, no. You don't have to. I think it's just nice to uh, to mention it. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So okay. Me... So oh. stop sharing. Then... Yeah, I'm going to start sharing my screen and then we can go to the rest of the program. So what I would like to do now in, in this presentation is to give you a few examples on how we use um, the zero cost deep learning for microscopy platform in my lab to, to um, basically do research. Uh, so. Um, but before I start this, I just wanted to briefly say where I'm calling you from, because of course the webinar are a little bit unpersonal and, and it's nice to kind of learn uh, um, a little bit about uh, each other. So just to, to let you know, so my lab is located in, in Finland, in Turku, which is uh, a small city right uh, uh, at the end uh, um, here of Finland, very south next to the sea. Uh, and as to be expected in Finland, we have warm summer and a fairly cold winter. And here is an example of, of, the, of the river uh, that's across uh, Turku, uh, which is frozen in, in the winter. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why I'm kind of highlighting this is that I'm hoping to see many of you uh, uh, to join us next year as, uh, because we are hosting the, um, the big uh, ELMI meeting, which is one of the international European light microscopy meeting. And we will have some session on, on image analysis. So I'm hoping that, that many of you will be able to come and, and visit uh, um, Turku and that we can also meet in person uh, there. Um, okay, but now uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the work that we do uh, in my lab. So I thought I would give you a very brief introduction so that you get an idea where, where I'm coming from. So I won't talk too much about the data that we actually generate, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, in my lab, we are working uh, to try to understand uh, cancer cell migration using microscopy technologies. And here is an example of an ovarian carcinoma cell that has been labeled to visualize the actin cytoskeleton and that is migrating uh, in, a, in a complex 3D environment. Um, and uh, basically, this is uh, the kind of things that, that we do. And uh, why we started to kind of use uh, a deep learning to analyze our microscopy images is because uh, we really thought that uh, this kind of new technology could help us get more out of microscopy data. Uh, so it's very, very brief introduction of the kind of things that we are interested in, uh, but hopefully kind of give you an idea of, of what I'm going to show you uh, next. So, so um, really the purpose of this talk is to try to show you uh, um, how do we use deep learning and what do we use it for. Um, and um, because of this, then I thought it would be nice to kind of give a little bit of a uh, overview of what can you actually use deep learning for. And if you think about it, you can actually use deep learning for almost any kind of uh, um, image analysis task now. So there's many different uh, deep learning networks that have been published to do a lot of things like object detection, segmentation, uh, um, image classification, and, and so on. Um, and uh, example that I want to show you here during these talks, that some of the things that we are using in my lab for research are uh, example of segmentation. We do a little bit of deep learning enable image registration, image restoration and denosing and image to image translation. Um, so I just want to kind of uh, go through a few of those examples to give you a flavor of, of how we use the zero cost platform to, to do research. Um, and the first example I want to talk about is denosing. And so why do we care about denosing? Well, we mostly care about denosing because um, it's very important to use denosing to try to improve live cell imaging. So I've shown you early on a movie of a migrating cell and um, you, you probably know that uh, when we use a fluorescent microscopy that lasers are very toxic for cells. So, so you need to use low laser power in order to image a sample, otherwise you will influence uh, what cells do and, and you might even kill the cells. You also know that if you start using fluorescent microscopy in living sample, you need to have uh, molecules that are proteins and, and so on that are fluorescently tagged to be able to see them. 
And, and very often you can uh, do that, especially for, for protein, by expressing your protein of interest. And if you express it uh, at too high level so that you can see it better, then very often that really affect the biology. So, so if you overexpress a molecule of interest, you might affect the, the behavior of, of the protein. So, so it's in your interest to use very low or endogenous expression level of what you want to look for. And, and if you do those two things together, uh, then you will almost always uh, get noisy images, which means that it's important to kind of have technologies that you can use to try to restore your images and, and remove most of the noise to only get uh, uh, the data that you want to have. Um, and so here is an example on, on some of our early days on using uh, deep learning for denoising using the fantastic tool uh, uh, developed by Kuhl et al, which is noise to void, uh, uh, that uh, um, enable uh, to, to do some denoising of microscopy data. Uh, um, and, and here, what you're looking at uh, are some of our noisy images. Um, so here, uh, we are looking at a cancer cell that's expressing a molecule of power paxilin which forms this plaque in the cells. And, but here, paxilin has been endogenously tagged. So we are looking at the endogenous molecules. We are also imaging cells on, on hydrogel, so we are not on the cover slip, so, so the imaging is a little bit more complicated. And because of this, our images are, are quite noisy. So there, we, we've been using noise to void to, to really try to denoise the data as much as we could and to better observe the structures of the cells here is making to, to attach to its environment. And for us, in this case, this was really important because what we really wanted to do it was to, to, to understand uh, how is the cells exerting uh, using those structures forces on this environment. So, so we were combining this live imaging using a high resolution traction force microscopy to understand how the cell is interacting with the environment. Um, so, so here, I just want to, I, I'm not going to go into any details, it's just to, to showcase on how we can now, using this kind of technology, to, to better understand uh, processes in, in living uh, sample. Um, another, uh, um, so, so you, you may realize, so as part of the um, uh, um, zero cost deep learning for microscopy, we now provide uh, a three different uh, denoising uh, deep learning networks. So, so one is, is CARE. Uh, um, one is noise to void that I've just introduced, and the other one, which is we've recently made a notebook for, which is deconoising. Uh, but here in this slide, I just wanted to re-emphasize some of the things that, that Roma presented in his talk, is that because now in this platform, we, we have different tools uh, that, that can perform the denoising and learn how to design microscopy images in a different way, then it's, it's really useful to, to use a quality control metrics to try to identify the best denoising strategy for your data. And, and the other thing that I want to highlight here is that uh, um, deep learning is not the only way that you can denoise data. There's a lot of other algorithms that have been uh, um, developed over the years to, to denoise data. And it's always good uh, to, to also compare uh, uh, how well those denoising uh, uh, data or denoising algorithm uh, uh, compare against uh, deep learning. So, so um, avoid the deep learning hypes, always uh, do a sanity check and, and is really deep, deep learning or the, the techniques that you're using, is it really the most optimal for what you want to do? So here's an example of, of using pure denoise, which is a, a Fiji plugin that's uh, quite good at denoising data. And, and here you can see in that particular example, uh, care is, is performing the best on this data set. As pure denoise can denoise your data, but you get much better results with this care. Uh, something else that, that we use a lot in the lab to, to, uh, to do our research is uh, structural elimination microscopy. So, so why do we use structural elimination microscopy? It's because it's supposed to be relatively life friendly and you can do multicolor, which is uh, two things that we of course care about a lot uh, when imaging our sample. Um, however, um, when people say that structural elimination microscopy is life friendly, they really mean it's life friendly compared to some of the other super resolution microscopy technology. And actually, uh, if you try to do some live imaging with SIM, there's one thing that you will realize very quickly is that often you get really noisy images because you still need to use quite high laser power to do uh, uh, live cell imaging with SIM. Uh, uh, which means that, uh, especially if you use uh, uh, red fluorescent proteins, you will either get, uh, uh, you will either kill your cells quickly or bleach your sample, or then you need to use low laser power to uh, 
to, to prevent this, which means that you get noisy images. So here's an example of breast cancer cells uh, and to look at the actin at cell cell junction in between cancer cells. And you can see that our live imaging here is called noisy. But using care, uh, uh, in, using care implemented with zero cost, we can really try to improve the quality of our microscopy images. So here I can play the movie and, and then hopefully you can really appreciate that uh, um, we can get nice data using the sim uh, on those really dynamic process, uh, but we can also uh, using uh, after that uh, care implemented in zero cost uh, to, to uh, really improve the quality uh, of those microscopy images. Um, and the way that we do it is that we train uh, for care specific training data sets, uh, uh, either using fixed samples so that we can really have high laser power and really nice looking images, or uh, basically a dedicated live sample where we kill the sample uh, just to generate that training data set. So here is an example where we generated uh, um, uh, high and low uh, quality images to train the, the care sample, and then we can get really high quality uh, uh, prediction out of it. And using this, this is a model that, that uh, we've generated using a dedicated training data set that we've trained in, in zero cost, then we can then denoise our live imaging uh, data. So that's something that we now do quite a lot in, in the lab is to, to produce dedicated training data set to improve uh, our uh, live imaging uh, data. Um, so that was about denoising. So I just want to mention some of the other things that we're doing. So one of which is image registration. So I won't spend too much time on it, but um, one of the projects that we have in the lab is to use zebrafish embryos uh, to uh, study changes uh, in, in morphological uh, features, especially related to the vasculature. And then we end up with, with hundreds and hundreds of images of zebrafish embryo and to be able to compare them nicely to each other, then we need to align the images. And it's actually something that's proven to be uh, really challenging to do using classical registration techniques. So then we've implemented uh, a deep learning algorithm called Dr. Mim, uh, which is uh, specializing in doing affine registration of 2D images. So, so then if you're interested in that kind of things then check out, we have a notebook to do that. Um, but what I want to spend most of my uh, time talking about is object tracking. So, um, in, in my introduction, I was telling you that in my lab, we are really interested in cell migration, which means that we spend a lot of time looking at moving cells and uh, we want to track them in order to gain a quantitative information on how specific molecules or environment regulates the way that cancer cells move. Uh, and uh, for many years, uh, we, we basically did that using manual tracking because there was not really anything that was working for us. Um, but recently, using those deep learning strategies, we've been using, uh, for instance, Stardist together with tracking algorithm, TrackMate, in, in order to improve uh, our automated tracking pipeline. And here is an example from a recent paper that we are currently putting together, where we are tracking uh, um, collectively migrating cancer cells, which have their, their nuclei uh, labeled, and then we use Stardist to, to detect the nuclei, and then you use TrackMate to do the automated tracking. In this particular case, we're interested in, in a molecule called myosin 10, and we found that if we remove myosin 10, uh, uh, then we can uh, uh, decrease the ability of the cancer cells to move, or at least they move a bit slower. Um, so, so if you're interested in that kind of application, uh, um, last year uh, we've uh, uh, published a small protocol paper in uh, the Faculty of the Thousand Research, uh, uh, where we uh, uh, basically explain on how we combine uh, Stardist and TrackMate to do automated tracking. Um, so actually there's several ways you can do that, but here is the way that we've, we've been doing it, is that we first train a, a Stardist model the same way that Roman just shown you in, in the demo using zero cost. And as part of the zero cost notebook, um, there is one of the outputs that you can choose, which is dedicated uh, to do tracking using TrackMate. So it's called a, a tracking file in, in, the, in the notebook. And um, with this, we can now do a, a batch analysis, both on the detection stage, but also in the tracking stage in using TrackMates, which is um, available in Fiji, uh, and start tracking hundreds and hundreds of videos, one after the others, in order to gain uh, quantitative information on how cells uh, are uh, moving. So, so I've shown you example uh, uh, using uh, cancer cells where the nuclei was labeled, but uh, you can also do the same using bright field movies. So here is an example of uh, um, T cells, so that are uh, uh, migrating on, on cover slips. Uh, and then here we've trained using zero cost dedicated 
um, start this model that can recognize those cells uh, from bright field images. So the model was trained in, in the zero cost platforms. And then we, we did the tracking using TrackMate uh, um, in, in Fiji. So those are data uh, provided by uh, Nathan Roy. And, and actually uh, um, using this pipeline, we were able to reproduce some of this data uh, showing uh, that uh, in this case, the T cells are migrating differently depending on whether they are attaching to ICAM or, or VCAM. So, so here is an example of the training data set that we've used in zero cost to train the start of this model where we have uh, a combination of the bright field images that we are interested in and uh, manually annotated mask here, which are labeled image. So you provide uh, this kind of data to, to the Stardust uh, uh, notebook in order to train your model. Then you can, uh, um, you can do the tracking uh, uh, after that. Um, and actually, we've been really excited about uh, uh, using Stardust and TrackMate because it's really uh, saved us a huge amount of time and allowed us to produce a lot of data related to, to, to cell migration. And because it, it seems to work so well, uh, and then actually we, we've uh, recently teamed up with uh, Jean-Yves Tineves' group, who is one of the main uh, authors of, of TrackMate, to, 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 to develop a new uh, TrackMate uh, uh, that uh, can incorporate uh, directly within TrackMate in Fiji deep learning and machine learning elements. So, so it's been a real pleasure to work with, with Jean-Yves on, on this project because he's really a, a track meet magician. So, so he's been able to, to implement a lot of different things that will be coming out soon uh, uh, in track meet in Fiji. And um, so um, basically among the new things that you will be able to do is that uh, Jean-Yves introduced in the new version of track meet that will be really soon, then you will be able to do tracking directly uh, from uh, um, Elastic projects, from VECA. So if you have uh, data that can be directly segmented using a VECA model, then you will be able to, to, to do that directly in TrackMate. You can use Stardis directly within TrackMate to, to do the detection and then TrackMate takes on uh, as a tracking. You can also use uh, Stardis custom model. So for instance, if you want to train it using zero cost, deep learning for microscopy, then you can import that directly into, into TrackMate in order to do uh, your tracking directly into Fiji. Uh, TrackMate will be able also to, uh, um, to take and do tracking directly from labeled image uh, um, in order to, to do the tracking of instant segmentation results. So for instance, results acquired using cell pose or embed seg or any of those other deep learning strategy that uh, produce labeled image. Um, so so the, the, a lot of different type of inputs can now, will now be available in TrackMate, uh, which is really exciting at least for, for us. Um, so then you will be able to, to track cells, track different objects. You will, of course, be able to do lineage tracing and, and so on. But what's also really exciting is that now in the new TrackMate, you will be able to follow changes of the shape over time, uh, which, which allow us to do a lot of different uh, uh, new kind of analysis of our migration data. You can also, of course, follow changes of intensity with those region of interest over time. And I will show you an example of that. And then you can also do some 2D to 3D labels, uh, magics that I will show you in, in the future slide. Uh, so here is kind of what uh, the interface look like. Uh, so if you've used TrackMate before, you will know that in one of the steps, you need to choose what kind of detector you want to use to basically identify the object that you want to track. And so now uh, here are some examples. You will have access to a Stardis detector or an elastic detector uh, or a label image detector. So, so uh, this new uh, version of TrackMate that, that Jean-Yves groups and, and us have been working on uh, will really uh, completely change how we can do tracking directly in, in Fiji. Um, so here, just some example of, of biological application on how this can be useful and how you can combine uh, zero cost deep learning for microscopy with, with TrackMates. Uh, is that here we've trained uh, um, a deep learning model in zero cost to detect the nuclei here. So here you're looking at cancer cells that have been labeled both for their nuclei, but they also express uh, um, an ERC activity reporter. So it's a, it's a fluorescent uh, molecules that when it goes to the nucleus, then you know that ERC, which is an important kinase, gets activated. Um, and we can use a Stardist integrated in TrackMate to identify those nuclei, and then we can track over time the changes of intensity of the ERC reporter in the nucleus, all of this directly into the, the new version of TrackMate. And then, of course, you can track the cells at the same time. So this is kind of what uh, the video looks like. By eyes, you will not be able to see many changes in the ERC video, and you can see that the TrackMate here is able to, to track the cells very, very nicely. 
But then, uh, because uh, it's all about extracting quantitative data from those movies, um, we are able to, to get information on the changes of ERK activity in the nucleus of the track cells over time, and to correlate that or not to the ability of cells to move at this time. So, so here is a heat map where each of the lane is a different cell. And then the changes in color highlight the changes of HERC activity in this particular cell. So, so for instance, in this cell, then the HERC activity at the beginning of the movie was really low. And then suddenly you get a peak of activation of HERC in this cell and, and so on. So with, the, with these abilities now to follow shape and intensity over time in, in, tra in, uh, in TrackMate, you can really gain a lot of different type of information in, in your tracking experiment, which is for us very exciting. Um, as I said, uh, the new version of TrackMate will be able to, to track directly labeled image. Uh, so for instance, now, if you want to use cell pose, uh, uh, which is a very popular uh, um, cell segmentation algorithm, which is based on, on deep learning, then you could, for instance, use our zero cost deep learning for microscopy cell pose notebook to uh, uh, predict uh, uh, your cells. And then you download the labeled image and then you can input that directly into TrackMate to, to track those cells over time. And then we have a function in our zero cost deep learning for microscopy notebook to do just that. So, so here is an example where you have collectively migrating cancer cells, where you have the actin and the, the nuclei labeled. Here are the predictions uh, uh, made by cell pose. So those were done in the zero cost deep learning for microscopy cell pose notebook. So we didn't retrain the, not, uh, the, the network here. We just use uh, the, the um, CYTO2 uh, model uh, uh, provided by the cell pose authors. And then we've used this labeled image here directly into TrackMate to do the tracking. Um, so, so here is an example using cell pose, but you can, of course, imagine that you can use any other kind of, of instant segmentation strategies that will give you a labeled image. So think SplineDist, which is also very good for segmentation or on bed seg. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to highlight regarding this, this new track mate is that now you will be able to, uh, 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 because the, the shapes are stored during the tracking, you can now use uh, track mates to uh, um, track objects in 2D and then track them in order to generate 3D label. So here you have a, a 3D rendering of a, of a asini of cancer cell going in 3D. Uh, um, and then you can see that you have nuclei uh, uh, everywhere. And that what we did is that we used Stardis 2D in TrackMate to identify the nuclei at each Z planes. Then TrackMate tracks those structures and then exports 3D labels out of those uh, tracks, which allow us to generate uh, a 3D uh, a segmentation using only a 2D algorithm. And this is really uh, uh, nice because uh, training 3D algorithms is really challenging because you need to annotate the data also in 3D, which is really time consuming. So now using uh, a TrackMate, you can use a 2D segmentation algorithm, track the segmentation over your Z stacks in order to reconstruct 3D labels, which uh, really can accelerate the way that we do 3D uh, uh, annotations. So, so here I just want to, to acknowledge the fantastic TrackMe team, which is uh, led by uh, Jean-Yves Tineves in the Pasteur Institute in, in Paris. Uh, so Joanna uh, uh, in my lab has been uh, pushing this forwards. And then also there's, of course, other people in, involved in the project. And, and uh, we don't yet have a release uh, date for, for TrackMate version 7, which will contain all those new improvements. But hopefully it should be in the next couple of months. So, so um, uh, stay tuned if, you're, if you are interested. Um, uh, so the last thing I wanted to, to uh, talk about uh, regarding the use of the zero cost deep learning for microscopy platform is model chaining. And uh, before I start on this, I just wanted to highlight one of the technologies that Roma uh, talked about, which is uh, using image to image translation uh, technology, for instance, using pix to pix. And that's basically predicting one image using another one. So here we have uh, images of actin, we have images of the nuclei, and then we can train peaks to peaks in this case to predict what the nucleus would look like based on the actin. And this is what the peaks to peaks prediction looks like on this particular data set. And you can see that the images are not only very realistic, which is uh, what peak to peaks is really good at, but they're also fairly accurate. So the, the prediction are, are really good. So, so why do we care about this? Then I'll just give you an example from our ongoing research in the lab where we are interested to understand how cancer cells interact with endothelial cells. 
And here, in this particular context, uh, we are flowing cancer cells on top of a monolayer of endothelial cells. And what we are interested in, of course, is to try to understand how this is regulated. So, so uh, we basically just have this kind of raw data, which is low resolution, bright field images, where you see you have uh, endothelial cells at the background, flowing cancer cells, and then here you have some cancer cells that are attached. So what we currently do in the lab is that we uh, train first a stardist model in order to detect and specifically recognize only the cancer cells. And this worked really nicely. We can then use TrackMate to specifically track the cells that are attached because they are the ones that we care about, or at least the cells that are attached for, us for a short period of time. All the ones that are freely flowing on top, we're not so interested in. So by using tracking, we can only keep the cells now that are attached. So this is already pretty neat because we can now get a lot of quantitative information on, on this specific population of cancer cells, just based on those bright field images. But using uh, um, image to image uh, translation algorithm, we can go even further. So here is again the same movies that I've just shown you. Um, then we can train a specific pix to pix uh, network in order to predict where the nuclei in all the cells present will be. And this is what kind of result we get, which is also really accurate. I'm not showing you the data here, but here is, is a fake image of where the nuclei will be on, in this particular movie. But you can also predict other places, such as cell-cell junctions, which is one of the areas that we are really interested in. So, so just from those bright field images, we can predict where the junctions are and where the nuclei are. Then we can use segmentation algorithms. So here uh, we use Stardist to detect where all the nuclei specifically of the endothelial cells are located. Here we use CellPose to detect where all the individual uh, uh, endothelial cells are located uh, to identify the junctions. And then we can put all of those things together in order to create our 8-bit video games where we can identify the nuclei of the endothelial cells, the junction of the endothelial cells, and then the attached cancer cells in this system. Just a, a prediction based on those uh, bright field data sets. And we are now uh, fine tuning this pipeline in order to try to better understand how cancer cells are interacting with endothelial cells on the flow and, and what kind of parameters is, is regulating them. So if you have more questions about this, I'm happy to, to chat about that later. Okay, so this is kind of all the application I wanted to, to, to mention. Uh, I just wanted to also highlight that the, our platform is always growing. So we currently have now 26 different notebooks to do a variety of, of tasks that are related to, to deep learning. I also want to say that we have uh, at least two to five new notebooks that should be released fairly soon in the coming months. So, so stay tuned, we'll have some exciting things that will be coming. Um, I also say that we are very interested in having people to contribute. So, so uh, if you're interested to, to generate your own zero cost deep learning notebooks, then don't hesitate to reach out. We have some guidelines regarding this. So, so don't hesitate to, to be in touch if that's something that you're interested uh, to, to contribute to. Um, don't hesitate also to reach out to us either via GitHub or the image.sc forum uh, if you have any questions and, and so on. Um, and so I will now just want to, to acknowledge the whole zero cost deep learning for microscopy team. So as Roman said, it's really been a, 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 a kind of a joint effort from many researchers around the world that have been helping us in, into building this, this pipeline. And finally, I just want to acknowledge my labs. So I've shown uh, you some of their data, so data from Gauthier, Johanna, and then Suzanne. And I also say thank you to the funding bodies that support our, our work. And on this, I think I've taken a little bit too much time. So now I'm gonna uh, stop here uh, um, and uh, hopefully answer the question you may have. And um, I'll let Roma carry on with the final demo if we still have time for that. Um, so th there aren't any questions that need to be addressed quite immediately. Um, so we could um, use the remaining six, seven minutes to go through one um final demo mo notebook demo what what do the organizers think yeah, yeah go ahead. I, I see some head nodding okay cool it, I, i'm glad because that's that's a notebook i'm really excited about and that will also address a, a range of issues that um that guillaume has also mentioned in his presentation and is the issue of um essentially um uh, creating training data set in a segmentation tasks, right? And so um, that actually, the notebook that will 
be showing you leverages uh, a collaboration in, in the work from Wei Ouyang. Um, and in particular, his, his fantastic work on, on Kaibu, uh, which allows actually to bring the human into the training loop. And so let me show you in particular how this works uh, through the, this just one slide. So let's imagine you've got a data set that looks like this and you wish to actually segment all of this and you've got a very huge data set. So deep learning will be great for you. Um, but you still need to segment a, a subset of this data set to provide a training data set uh, for, for the model. Um, so what you will do is you will then take an annotator and then start drawing things by hand, right? And that's exactly what um, Kaibu interface actually does. But what's really important is um, once you have um, a really hand-drawn handful of little small patches of your data set, you can already start sending those data sets to, um, to a background trainer. And what I mean by that is a, is a model that will train in the background uh, while you keep segmenting by hand. And so what happens is your little patch, will, will, which will take just seconds, a few seconds to, to segment, can be sent to the trainer. And that can be directly used to start a training session using Enjoy. Um, and um, while this is being trained, we now have access to a, a model that is tuned to that particular data set, admittedly on very few patches. So it will not perform very well initially, but it will perform somewhat. So what this means is that we've, we now have a model that can be used to pre-segment any new small patches that you start labeling by hand. So what this means is we enter into a virtuous uh, cycle of uh, creating more segmented data set, as well as improving the quality of a small model that will uh, therefore um, perform better and better over time. So that means that within 10, 15 minutes of manually segmenting a few things and then uh, using um, the, the model prediction to pre-segment and then um, uh, improve on the segmentation that offered by the um, by the segmentation model then you can build a, a very strong data set pretty quickly and so you see how um, you know using the prediction and feeding that back into a user interface that can be analyzed by hand by the user is actually very powerful so we now have a human and the machine working in parallel towards building a better data set and a better model and so um, what this allowed us to do in particular is build data sets such as what um, Guillaume's just shown you earlier. And this, in fact, what I'm showing you right here is um, was also built through uh, the TrackMate uh, 3D extension to be able to do 2D to 3D trick. Um, but without further ado, let me just show you um, that notebook and it's called Interactive Segmentation uh, Zero Cost Notebook and it's also available from our wiki. And so I've already pre-installed things in the interest of time. Um, I will just load a little bit of, of data to be able to, um, to show you just a very quick example of this. So Kaibu, I've got a little bit of data from a fantastic colleague um, right here called Chantal Rubinet. Um, and she's got some, um, she's, she's happy to share with me um, some uh, neuroblastoma cells neuroblastoma um, that were labeled for lamin. And so what we have here is a little bit of um, nucleus, nuclear images like this, right? So I've loaded that data set. It doesn't have any um, masks associated with it yet. Um, and so we can now uh, start giving a little bit more information in terms of where the model will be saved, that little model that trains in the background and similar to before, um, let's give it uh, today's date, Kaibu model one, um, and let's and we can also use a pre-trained model in this particular case as well. So let's let's prepare prepare model, and let's start uh, the important part, which is the uh, user interface, which is what's coming up in just one second. And as I was saying, that user interface leverages uh, both uh, the um, uh, Kaibu, uh, both Kaibu and Imjoy, which are work from Wei Ouyang. Um, and so this work is in collaboration with him. Um, 
So we now have an, the user interface and we can actually full screen this, but let me just load first a small, small patch. And so you see if I get um, a bit of images, uh, this one is just the edge of a cell. You know, we've got a handful of, um, handful of nuclei in this particular patch. Uh, but let's, let's move to um, full screen. There you go. Um, uh, sorry, just a little mistake. Uh, there you go, it's back. And now we can full screen this, get an image. So this is a little bit of background. Um, this is quite a range of nuclei. There you go, we've got a couple of nuclei in here. Let's run already a prediction from that pre-trained model that I was telling you about. And we already have a handful of segmentation, but what you see right here is a number of them are actually not done properly. So we can actually delete a handful of them. Um, the ones that we think may well be a little bit, um, a little bit dodgy. And so what we can now do is just redraw the ones that we think were done poorly. There you go. And here's another example right here. Um, there you go. There was a couple of examples in that corner too. Let's redraw this and redraw this too. And so you see that's as simple as this. The red ones are the ones that were already kind of segmented okay from the pre-trained model. And the green ones are the ones that I've modified. And so we can now send that little patch already for training uh, is now being sent to the machine uh, as I was telling you um, so we can now actually now we already have one little patch sent for training we can actually start the training so if I now take a quick look at what's going on over there a training uh, session has started in the background and um, every time I will send a new patch it will now take into account that new patch for training and will improve over time. So now I'm, I've got on a new patch, um, run a prediction, which is now already using the new data set that I've sent. Um, it's relatively decent. We might want to maybe modify one or two or amend one or two of those um, little examples. This is not ideal, so I'll remove these. Um, so let's draw a handful more by hand so you see that this um, will just take a minute because now you see that the vast majority have already been segmented uh, pretty well the vast majority of those nuclei so we can just resegment one or two roman yes sorry. okay just one really quick question um sure somebody asks if you can show if the brightness can be changed in kaibu or uh, um, so there's a little bit of adjustment that can be made to the images um but not a whole lot at the moment uh, the images are saved or the patches are saved such that the brightness should be um uh, pre-optimized or contrasted optimally already by default um, but it's also a work in progress and we, or a way I should say, keeps adding new functionalities to Kaibu, including that kind of things. Um, so if there is, if the particular image transformation that you're looking for isn't available quite yet, uh, it, it's likely will be available to you very soon. So I will be sending this for training. Um, and so we now have um we now have sent a couple of patches and so let's try predicting on this for instance and there you go and you see that it's already done a decent job at quite a quite a number of them it's missed some low intensity ones uh, so maybe I, I would i would redraw uh, one or two of those right here um but you get the idea you get the idea and so you see how very quickly you can build here, even just in a couple of minutes, you can build some very good quality um, patches, segmented patches with their, with their masks um, in the view of building a training data set. 
And so if we go back to the notebook now, um, we can now check the annotated uh, training images and I've only, I've only been built two of them right here. So you see them there. Uh, but what we can do also is stop the training and then take a quick look at the very few. Um, we can do the evaluation of the model just like before, just like in the other notebook and in particular look at the loss function. It will look pretty messy because you see the points at which I've added the um, the individual um, the individual additional patches to the training, and you see how um, the evolution of the loss curves will um, will look like over time. And every time you add a specific patch, of course, it'll kind of spike off. Um, but you could also do the error mapping on that model eventually and also do use that train model um, also eventually once the validation is performed. I should say that right here, uh, all of this is only um, working on cell pose models um, and, in, and we can use some of the uh, cell pose pre-trained models um, initially to start already running predictions even before any patches have been segmented. Um, but Way is also working on a range of other type of segmentation networks to be implemented in this. Um, but I've shown you right here, even just within a couple of minutes, I could already start building very good quality um, segmentations. Um, so in the interest of time, I will stop right here. And um, I'll, uh, um, I'll um, be happy to take any further questions in the forthcoming minutes. And otherwise, um, I'm really happy to have taken part in this and I hope you guys all taken took something back from this. And um, we're always happy to receive contributions, feedback or anything and um, also suggestions and um, network to implement and other aspects of uh, how to improve the platform altogether. Um, so feel free to get in touch with us if there is anything. And I'd like to thank the organizers again for for having us today. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo Omar. So thanks a lot for, for inviting us. Um, and so I hope uh, also thank you for joining the webinar. I hope you've, you've uh, found it interesting. Don't hesitate to reach out. I think we're gonna spend the next few minutes answering the, all the questions that are left. Uh, and, and I also think that many of those answers will be put on the image.hc uh, uh, um, web pages. Um, so so if, if you can't find an answer just yet, then, then bear with us. We will find a time to, to put it online later on. Thanks a lot, guys. This was very well structured and very nice and easy to follow. It was great. Thank you. Um, would you like to answer any of the questions live? I, I've not kept up with the um, questions in the last few minutes. So if do you, do you guys, did you guys see any burning questions that we could discuss live in the, the next five, 10 minutes? Uh, I not, can, can read some yeah. to you. <laughs> Um, I think we can answer most of them probably better in a written way. Um, one question was, does Kaibu work in 3D? It doesn't yet, but um, using the trick that Guillaume described earlier of uh, linking Z planes or segmented Z planes uh, across, across the Z axis uh, works really well, in fact. And the, the data set that I've shown you on the neuroblastoma was actually done this way. And, um, and again, to, 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 to repeat the advantages of doing it this way is that it's a lot easier to train a 2D model as opposed to training a, a 3D model. So that's a, good, that's a good trick that a lot of people start using. Okay, yeah, I think thank you, might you very much again. There's a question in the, in the chat. Cool. All right, so we will stop this webinar. Uh, the recording will be available on YouTube and please remember to give feedback and suggest new topics so that we can organize, organize new webinars for you guys. Thanks. So